I um, figured I had 23 years seniority built up, possibly last up until I was in my 40, 40 years sometime at least before I retired and then to look back and see it all falling away. Everything that you had planned on just seems like a waste of time. There must be thousands, maybe millions of them that's getting the same song and dance that my husband got. When they reach their time for retirement, there is no funds to pay them. This man, Hoffa, on there, retired with a $1.7 million lump sum pension. And I can't get $300 a month out of them on there for my retirement. Where does, this, where does all this money go that's been paid into these pensions? The pension system is essentially a consumer fraud, a shell game, and a hoax. As a matter of fact, when you say it's a consumer fraud, you pay it an undue compliment, because typically we think of consumer frauds in terms of short transactions, the purchase of an automobile, the purchase of a pair of pants. But with the pension system, you really have a long-term contract that may run 50 or 100 years that's designed to guarantee the security of our population. Essentially, you have an insurance contract that doesn't perform. You have an insurance contract that can't be relied on. You have an insurance contract that can't be trusted. And I think it's a terrible thing in this country where men who work 45 years have to eat yesterday's bread. And I don't want to compete on my old legs against other old men on old legs running down a supermarket aisle to get dented cans and stale bread. I don't... Uh, it's not a life I like. It's not a life I don't want to look forward to. So I, I really have nothing to look forward to at 65. This is a story about ordinary people with the modest hope to finish their working careers with enough money to live in dignity. That is a modest hope, but it's one that is all too often not realized. There's a widely held belief in this country that public disclosure is a good thing, that it inhibits misconduct and helps to keep people honest. That's why these files are full of pension plans, private pension plans. Under the law, all such plans must submit annual reports on their activities to the Department of Labor. And these annual reports wind up here, roughly 34,000 of them, in a building in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside Washington. The Labor Department has the right to audit them, and to a limited extent, where wrongdoing is discovered, the government may prosecute. Also, the reports are available to anybody who asks to see them. But as it works out, that is a meager protection for the 25 million Americans who are in private pension plans. There are millions of hopes and dreams in these files. If experience is any guide, very many of the hopes will prove to be empty and the dreams will be shattered and the rosy promises of happy and secure retirement in a vine-covered cottage will prove to be false. Understandably, there's a good deal of bewilderment about this and bitterness among those who find nothing where they thought that pension plan payments were going to be. The Labor Department, therefore, receives, in addition to the annual reports of pension plans, complaints about them and appeals for help. A lot of these are passed along by members of Congress. For example, I understood that I was covered under a very good pension plan to which I did not contribute. It was 100% paid by the company. But it did uh, mean a lot to me. And I had several other job offers which I refused or didn't even consider because I knew I had security to build up for the future. I started when I was 19 years old. Stephen Duane used to be a warehouse foreman for the A&P supermarket people in New Jersey. 18 months ago, the A&P closed the warehouse and discharged the men who worked there. Duane lost all his years of pension credits. And in my old age, I would uh, be happy and secure in the pension and the benefits that I thought I had with the A&P. At the uh, end of these 15 years, the company was bought out and the new owners decided to close down the air division. So I had less than a week's notice and I was let go, as well as everybody else in the air division with no severance pay and nothing. Absolutely out in the street after 15 years with nothing. When the time came to talk about the pension, we were, all, we were staggered. Uh, we did have books, but nobody took bother in looking at the books that you feel you're going to be pensioned, and that's it. So when they finally told us that the men it had to be 55 years and over to collect the pension, I was the big loser. I had a brother the same time as me down there. We were the big losers. 32 years of our life was given up, and we had nothing, nothing absolutely to show for it. 
Dwayne discovered what a lot of other people have, that it's not easy for a man in his 50s to find a new job. He wound up as a laborer in another warehouse, where he has to compete with much younger men. But no matter how hard Dwayne works, it's almost certainly too late for him to start building pension credits again. It's a terrible experience, an experience I would never like to see anybody else go through. That is why I, I feel so deep about this pension, so that future men won't feel like I do. You wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, knowing all your work, all your life is, is gone down the drain. That was just a number. Number 72 was my number. No Steve Dwayne, a Laura worker. I worked, I remember I had 17 years, we're only four days out. Uh, but that, what does that mean to them? It means nothing. They just turn you out in the street because it's an economy move. I personally wrote a letter to the president of the AMP, not yelling at him. I want to discuss with him. Some kind of moral obligation, just me and him. How does he feel? How does he put his head on a pillow knowing that you have men walking the streets? I, I don't know. It's a very... It's a deep emotional thing with me. Sometimes uh, <clears throat> I'm ahead of it, sometimes I'm not. That's my feeling on the thing. We've come across in our questionnaires and, and other uh, uh, surveys some of the most tragic cases imaginable, where people will work for 25, 30 years, and just for, uh, because of a, of a tiny quirk uh, uh, in the uh, pension plan's uh, fine print, uh, they don't get anything. When you get to B65, you're out of work and you need a source of money. And that's what a pension plan is supposed to do. Unfortunately, it's woefully inadequate. Over half the people have nothing at all from pension plans, and those that do typically have only $1,000 a year. So even if you have Social Security, most pension funds are inadequate. And there are a lot of people who just believe because something is printed and because they've heard some glowing words about it, that that means it's a lead pipe thing, that they're actually going to have it when they need it. It may not be so. Many employees form their ideas about pensions by reading the slick brochures that their company or union gives them. Most of these booklets do make a pension seem a sure thing. The many restrictions and exclusions are buried in fine print or concealed by obscure language. The Senate Labor Committee has been looking at these brochures as part of its general study of the pension problem. Senator Harrison Williams is chairman of the committee. Uh, we ha I have all kinds of description of plans here, uh, and all of them just suggest the certainty of an assured benefit upon retirement. Uh, here's a man, this was from the, a brewery, uh, sitting relaxed with a glass of beer and checks coming out of the air. Well, you see, this gives a false hope, a sense of false security. Senator, the way private pension plans are set up now, are the promises real? The answer is they are not. So you want to get some reality behind the promise, Senator? Uh, exactly. We don't want uh, just these golden general descriptions of uh, what can be expected under the plan. Uh, we want clear and precise and understandable description of the reality. Uh, the worst example that I've seen is this description uh, that is wholly unintelligible to anybody but an advanced lawyer. If an employee makes the election provided for, is that the one? Yes. If an employee makes the election provided for in subparagraph 2 of paragraph B of this section 6, his monthly pension as determined under either section 3 or subparagraph 1 of paragraph A of section 4, whichever applies, shall be reduced by the percentage set forth in paragraph C of this section 6, as if the employee has made the election provided for in subparagraph 1 of paragraph B of this section 6, and shall be further reduced actuarially on the basis of the age of the employee and his spouse at the time such election shall become effective, the sex of the employee and the spouse, and the level of benefits payable to the employee's spouse in excess of the level of benefits in the election provided in subparagraph 1 of paragraph B of this section 6. Well, maybe I didn't read it very well. Uh, well, of course, you understand it, though. Perfect. <laughs> it's almost an obstacle course, and the miracle is when someone actually collects with the plan. There have been studies that indicate that most people won't collect. 
I think we need controls of the same type we apply to insurance companies. Your money should be funded, so it's going to be there at age 65. Today, it's almost a miracle if it's there at age 65. You have to go to work for an employer. You have to stay with them. You have to stay in good health. You have to avoid layoffs. You have to take your money, turn it over to the employer, hopes that he invests it safely and soundly. You have to hope that when you're age 65, the employer is still around and he's not likely to be in terms of the high mortality of business. So there's almost a sequence of miracles which you're counting on. In one study made by our subcommittee of 51 pension plans covering 6.9 million workers since 1950, 92% of the workers in these plans left without any benefits whatsoever. Workers are losing their pension rights when their companies go bankrupt, merge with other companies, or simply go out of business. Workers are losing their pension rights when they are forced to leave one job to find another. We will hear testimony from five retired employees at Horn and Hardart, men and women in their 60s and 70s, who have worked an average of 40 years or more for the company. Today, they are retired and forced to keep working because the company has hit financial difficulty and has had to give up its pension plan. They called me into the office. They said, Grimes, you almost about time for you to go out. I said, is that so? <laughs> well, I said, uh, go out for what? I heard of people retiring. I mean, but he said, well, you know, everybody got to retire. I said, I didn't know this. I said, I'm not ready to... I said, I'm not ready to retire. I said, I have no, I have no money. I said, I owe everybody in Philadelphia, which I did. I said, I'm trying to send my, and, and, and told them, I said, I'm not ready to retire. They made me retire on account of the age. Yeah. They called me in and I went and uh, Mr. Downey was the ma uh, man over the place at the time. And he said, he figured up what I would get. And after taking out other compensations, I got $50.48 a month. They claimed that this plan would make us financially independent along with our social security and whatever income we might have saved. They said that this plan, you will not have to worry about anything. Then all of a sudden they said, we can't pay you anymore because uh, the funds has run out and we have to sell some property in order to recuperate and get some old funds into this benefit. And then that was uh, cut off in October of 71 uh, when they went to uh, bankruptcy. That's right. As Mr. Grimes said, they stopped and then they started it again. And they finished it in uh, November 1971 and that was it. I don't get anything at all. Nothing at all. For all of those years. When I retired in 66, I was getting uh, $55 in pension money. I could make it with that, with my Social Security. Had you expected to, to get a, a full pension for the rest of your life? Yes, I, 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 at the time the pension plan was established, we got literature uh, stating what we were going to get, and, and I was satisfied with my at that time, I was satisfied with Social Security. I thought I could, I knew I could sort of make it like that. But when it collapsed, uh, I collapsed with it. I, I have here a booklet. Uh, it's called uh, Horn and Hard Art Retirement Pension Plan. I assume this was something that was yeah, passed have, out yeah, to, the, to the employees. And no doubt you all have one. And I'm mm. sure that, that it, uh, it spells out what you yes. expected to get in terms of your benefits. I think uh, significant on the inside uh, back cover, it says, Happy retirement to you when your turn comes. <laughs> <laughs> this was the Baldwin Lima Hamilton Heavy Equipment Plant near Philadelphia, where 1,300 men used to work. They were the sort of people who thought security was important and they had passed up bigger wage increases in favor of a better pension plan. When the plant closed in April, many of the men discovered their pension rights had disappeared. I've heard a lot of guys say, the only reason I stayed was for my pension. Now there is no pension. So in order to have all this go down the drain, let's face it, it affected every one of us on one way or another. 
what's going to happen to me? Here I am, I'm now 59 years old. When people get up in age and the bottom drops out, like what happened to us, it's a crime. After 30 years there, and I've got nothing, I mean, it's gone down the drain, 30 years of service. Now, I can make up, I can get up into another place there and I'll get 15 years, but uh, that's not going to amount to anything. Well, so, and, so there goes my future plans there. I mean, I figured, you know, well, I'd like to put the boy through college, but what can I do now? I'm afraid to. Yeah, a younger person has does have some chance to, to do it, but uh, no uh, in my age, uh, you've made that round. There's no more. In other words, I've, I'm, uh, I missed the pension here by about four months. Everybody was just relying on a pension. And if they knew today all the stuff, they would have never stayed there as long. Yeah, but George, do you realize that there's so many people, working people, that under the impression that they've got a pension coming, they don't even realize that they could be in the same fix as what and, we are. And they're lulled into a complacency in which uh, they, don't they, they, they don't realize that this can happen. They think, oh, I'm doing all right. I'm sure. getting my paycheck and I've got a pension, but he didn't read the fine print. Well, we well, felt that is, way ourselves two yeah. years ago. This is where I thought I had it. I thought when I reached... Uh, the age of 65 or even 62, I'd have approximately 45 to 47 years with the company. And I could turn around and retire at $6 a, a month uh, for every year's uh, a service. I mean, that would... And possibly would... As, as the years went on, that, that figure would have increased. Yeah, I lose faith in, in a government that allows things like this. Uh, not long ago, I was in New York and I saw that inscription on the Statue of Liberty. And it sounded... Wonderful, you know. When you give read. us your tarred and so on. But what it actually said was, give us your cheap labor. Get these hunkies in here where we can put them to work for nothing. That's what it amounted to. An employee becomes much more expensive to a company once he has been vested. That is, guaranteed a pension. This man, Alan Sorensen, says he helped to prove that point in a study he did for a large department store chain. After the study was made, so Sorensen says, the company got rid of many long service employees before they could achieve vested pension rights. Sorensen himself was transferred out of company headquarters, winding up in Salt Lake City as a store manager. That is, Sorensen was a store manager until he was fired last year after 22 years of service. He now works as a checkout clerk in this Salt Lake City store. Sorensen told us he had been only a few years away from his vested pension rights. I definitely feel that I was terminated because I was approaching an age where I would have vesting and uh, they had terminated so many long service employees just prior to terminating me that uh, it all seemed to fall into a very definite pattern. And the reasons you were given for being let go, how did they seem to you? They seemed very shallow because my past record was such that uh, it was above reproach. Uh, I had never had a serious shrinkage in the total time that I had been a store manager. Within the last two or three years before I was terminated, they terminated a great many store managers with long service with the company. People who would be approaching the age, the... Approaching the age of vesting and retirement. Mm -hmm. See, by terminating these people before they reached age 65, this cuts their uh, pension benefits back drastically. Up in Chicago, I worked for 24 years for the Kelling Nut Company. And, uh... Earl Schrader was a corporate executive in a company that had been taken over by a large conglomerate. Several other executives had been fired, and Schrader was worried about what promised to be a substantial pension. He was only six months away from his vested pension rights. A retirement plan at age 60 uh, by having put 20 years service with the company. I had put in my 20, 20 years, in fact, 24 years with the company, but I didn't have the age requirement of 60. I was called from my office to a lunch with one of the executives of uh, Kelling Nut Company, Corn Products Company, our vice president for finance. 
and informed that uh, henceforth uh, I would no longer be with the company. And I said, Walter, what do you mean? He says, well, Earl, I hired you 24 years ago. Today I'm firing you. Why? Well, we've decided you're too good for the company, and uh, we have no other spot for you. I was at the time assistant secretary of the company. The secretary of the company, he was locked off uh, at 30 years service. I had a warehouse manager in Albany, Georgia, Howell III, who was lopped off two months before uh, he would be vested in the plan. He had his time, he had his age. This poor individual became so ill and upset over it that he shot himself, took his own life. Driving a truck in Chicago wears a man down fast, so the truck drivers have always been concerned about pensions. And in most respects, the pension programs run by the Chicago Teamsters Union locals are among the best. Benefits are generous, and a Teamster can retire as early as age 57. Many feel that after 20 or 30 years behind the wheel, retirement can't come soon enough. When I was young, I was like a bull. I thought I was big and tough. Then I started in the taxi cabs, driving a cab. You sit, your kidneys, your back, your head, everything just goes. When you get older, same thing, only worse. Every truck driver, I think, thinks forward to the day that they're going to retire. And if you got the, the seniority, you think you're well established. You're not thinking about somebody cutting you, shooting you down or something, about cutting your pension off. <laughs> The trouble is, every Teamster local in the Chicago area runs its own pension plan. And it's common practice for a man to be forced to transfer from one local to another every time he changes jobs. From driving to the loading dock, for example. Or from loading to checking waybills. Or from an outside to an inside job. Sometimes different groups of Teamster members working for the same company, or even in the same garage, will be in different Teamster locals. A Teamster must have 20 years of membership in one local to draw a pension. His pension rights are not portable. He cannot take them with him from one local to another. A lot of drivers don't know that until it's time for them to retire. And when they do find out, they can't understand why it should be so. When they started up this pension plan, I don't think they were strictly honest with the people. I mean, with the people, I mean the truck drivers. They didn't come out in these detail and say, you got to have 20 years in this, this local only that you can get a pension. As far as I'm concerned, with the amount of years that I have with the company, I should get a full pension. I've got my 20 years with the company, but you got 10 years over here, I got 11 years over here. It's the same thing on there. You would put money in one bank and then go on the west side and put a, a, a part of your money into another bank on there. And when it comes time to draw it out on there, they tell you, oh, we're sorry on there. You put your money in two banks. We refuse to give it to you. This is the same principle. I have money in two different locals. Almost 21 years with one outfit, and I can't see why one local can't get together with the other local, which I'm in, and there's nothing to it. This one has to give me half, the other one gives me half, and they make a whole out of it. All right, so what's, what's hard about that? You go down to the unions, you beg, you talk to the people, they give you a deep, deep fear. Yeah, we'll take care of it. Yeah, we'll take care of it. But they don't. The union was, to me, a brother, and that they wouldn't sell me down the river. They wouldn't deprive me of something on there that was paid for, that I was looking forward to, by little technicalities on there. They're taking away by uh, lying to the men. They're taking away by pulling out the fine print in their pension programs. They're taking away by uh, keeping the men ignorant of these pension programs, of these pension rules. You cannot change unions. So what do you do then? If you can't change unions, if you have to get another job and you have to go in another union, what are you going to do then? Do you start all over again? 
Are you going to go ahead and build up time, time, time? You can't do it. What are your plans for the future? I have no plans. What can I do? I just gonna, I'm just going to have to live out my time and do the best I possibly can with what little what money that got. we get from Social Security. And what we that, have in That's the all I have forward. That's all I can, can look forward to. Nothing else. You've got people driving those trucks that are as high as 68 years old. 68 years old driving a 72 or 73,000 pound unit with such commodities as explosives. Jet fuels, gasolines, oils, plastics. 68-year-old man driving this truck. They're not going to last. Somebody's going to get killed. They should have been pensioned about 10 or 12 years ago. That's the way I figured it was going to be. And that's the way we all figured, all the old timers. We figured that if we put in there 20 or 25 years, when we retired, we would get a pension. But no, because they got cheated, they still have to work. But can you imagine a 68-year-old man on an interstate with anywhere from 72 to 74,000 pounds coming at you? The flaws in the private pension system hurt middle class and working class people most. Rich people don't need pensions, and the very poor never build up any pension rights they can lose. People don't get the pensions they expect for many reasons. One is that most plans require you to work in the same place for 25 or 30 years or more. Other people lose their pensions because the plan runs out of money. At this moment, the coal miners fund is operating in the red and the railway retirement system is running an annual deficit. It's also common for workers to get smaller pensions than they expect, partly because many plans treat highly paid executives much better than lower and middle level employees. Women get the worst treatment. They seldom work in one place long enough to qualify. And the wife of a pensioner usually gets nothing after her husband dies. What's wrong with the system is most evident to the social workers helping the aged and to a few labor leaders who take an interest in retirement problems. In the United States, we have a magnificent ability to cover up our own diseases, especially the disease of big business. Pensions in the private area are a mockery. They're a national disgrace. We know this. The place where it gets very difficult is with your fairly average middle income, middle class person who arrives somewhere between 62 and 65 at retirement, uh, finds their income cut sometimes as much as 70 percent. Um, these are the folk that, uh, you know, I think have the most difficult time. Uh, they're sometimes our most difficult clients because they're bitter, uh, they're resentful. Uh, our society being what it is, they've, they've postponed thinking about old age and its, its problems. And all of a sudden they find themselves old and poor. Well, these people feel, uh, who, who worked all their lives, and let's say they've worked 35, 40 years, and many of them have worked for one employer for all these years, uh, they feel that now that they've retired, they're going to live a better life. They won't have to get up early in the morning. Uh, they won't have to go to work and to be able to do all the things that they couldn't do when they were working. And then they find themselves in the position that they have no money, they have no friends, and they live in squalor and they can't do these things. So what the, they've really been cheated, cheated by the pension system, cheated by Social Security, cheated by their employer, and they feel very angry at themselves because I think in the back of their mind they knew this was going to happen. They knew that when the day came that they would retire, they would be worse off than when they were working, but they're afraid to admit it. They don't eat meat. It's soup. It's low of economic. When they go into the supermarket, you know, the thing you discover is that they're the special hunters. Their housing situation is an atrocity. We know this. We've now discovered them, so we're trying to build housing for the aged. And there's a thrust in this direction. The aged poor. Well, there's not enough housing. There's not enough housing for the aged poor so that you'll find that the ghetto is interestingly enough a fascinating area the ghettos are composed of mainly the black and puerto rican poor and then you will find spotted throughout aged whites as well as the black and puerto rican this is integration of the poor integration based on lower economic status 
they're kind of uh, waiting around. Uh, so what we've done in, in our country is create uh, God's waiting rooms all over the country, in Miami, New York, in Boston, in Los Angeles, uh, in Philadelphia, where old people kind of wait around for the day to come where they're going to die. We're living too long. And in some areas, if we could just disappear, it would be very, uh, very nicely to the community at large. But we are not disappearing. We are still here. And we're growing older and older. The age now, uh, 90 and 95, is not too uncommon. Even 100 is not too uncommon. And the result is this, that we have made no plans to retire. You can't make it on Social Security. Maybe after that 20% increase, we can. As far as I'm concerned, if we had just, uh, say, a hundred and a half more a month, we could make it pretty good. But now when a bill comes up, you've got to figure how you're going to meet it. See, if the car breaks down for a hundred dollars, you got to start skimping or go to the bank. You've got two or three hundred left in there and draw one of them out. It's all. And that's like pulling teeth. We'll get by. We'll just have to get by. We'll have to eat less. If we had any indebtedness at all, we'd never make it. Makes you feel bad, and a lot of times you just sit there and think, my age, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? You know, you can't say anything. The average person, elderly person who lives on Social Security, old age assistance, and perhaps some money they've been able to save, income runs about $180 a month. They've literally got to watch every nickel and penny. Going to a movie is a big expense. Taking a bus to a clinic to visit a doctor is a big expense. Buying a new pair of shoes is a big expense. Getting ill and having to get medicines is a big expense. This is where, if there was an adequate pension system in the United States, along with Social Security, uh, some of these problems could be avoided. Retired people like to live in places that are warm and cheap. There are towns in California and Florida where more than half the adult population is retired. Years ago, older people lived with their working age children. Now, in our mobile society, the elderly have taken to living in trailer parks filled with other retired people. That means retirement is a lot more expensive than it used to be, and the elderly are complaining much more about needing money. The average retired person depends on Social Security for most of his income. So the big day is the third of the month, the day the Social Security checks arrive. Everybody's out. They're standing at the door for the mailman. And they grab this little check and they haul off to the bank with it, see? And uh, you get in line up there to get your check out. And we, we try to let it go to the next day because it takes too much of your time standing there. And then they run off to the grocery store, and the grocery stores all run big sales. The you know, on the day they're going to have us, uh, you can get yourself a steak for if you're lucky for a dollar and a half. But the retirement's not, unless you can adapt yourself, it's not for the lively person. If somebody's sickly and can't enjoy it, there's nothing to enjoy about it. But if you can prepare yourself to accept a quiet life, and you and your wife figure what you want to do with yourself during the day, and you, you can make it. We have fishing and take an umbrella and a couple of chairs and go down to the beach and sit there for early part of the day before it gets too hot. And then we come back and uh, turn the air conditioner on, spend the afternoon in the house. <laughs> visit, we have a couple of friends around here we visit with. But it's nothing exciting. You don't have the money to get exciting. Your wife likes to go, and I would love to go too, but you can't afford to drop 10 or $20. You go down to these restaurants, and I may have a meal less than $3. But uh, they got some beautiful malls, and one thing or another, you can loaf around in, air conditioned. We went in one yesterday, Ma's, I think it was. Down there, the wife pulled about four bolts of material out. And tell him, how do you like this? And I go through the routine. It's a little, a little loud or a little conservative. And, and she throws them back in a pile and walks on. <laughs> and the girls follow her around putting them in. But that keeps them busy. They got something to do. I imagine all these old people do that. I don't know. 
The crux of the matter now is that increasing numbers of Americans are reaching retirement age. They should not be expected to live in poverty or near poverty or, cut it to a higher, lead a drab, penny-pinching sort of existence. More, obviously, is that anything the rest of us would want to look forward to. The refrain that runs through what we've been hearing is a kind of incomprehension. What emerges over and over again is that these people played the game. They did what Americans were expected to do. They worked and met their obligations. But at the end of their working lives, they found that they were in trouble. Put simply, they did not have enough money. The pension plans that they thought were going to take care of them didn't. Now, it may be that some of them did not save as much money as they might have. The urge to consume in American life is very strong. Also, inflation played its part, and maybe they were careless about what the pension plans they were in actually could do. In any case, at the end of their working lives, they feel cheated and cast aside. This social security measure gives at least some protection to 30 millions of our citizens who will reap by... Most people didn't have any sort of steady retirement income until the first social security law was passed. Social Security was to take care of working people when they got old. At least that was the impression given by this government publicity film. But no one who ever had to live on Social Security alone has ever considered the monthly benefit to be enough. It was enough, perhaps, where people also saved money for their old age or got help from their children. The private pension system really got started when wage controls were put into effect during World War II. Fringe benefits were exempt from controls, and since labor and management couldn't talk about much else, they began to negotiate pension plans. Companies also started using pension plans as a way to keep skilled employees. The idea was that a man would not be tempted to look for another job if he had a paid retirement to look forward to. Today, labor unions consider pension benefits to be part of the wage package. Higher income workers now want more assurance that they'll actually get their pensions, Lower income workers think they have a right to better pensions than they get now. For that matter, Major League Baseball players struck last spring for improved pensions. In New York not long ago, angry municipal workers paralyzed the city by opening drawbridges and blocking highways. They wanted their pensions improved to match the gains made by policemen and firemen and by some workers in private industry. If there is a pensions crisis, it is, at least in part, a crisis of rising expectations. Another crisis of sorts involves the vast amounts of pension fund investments. James Hoffa was convicted of criminally mishandling pension fund investments. So was the leader of a Chicago barber's union. Pension funds have outgrown the laws regulating them. No government agency has enough staff or authority to control them. The Justice Department's labor section believes it's common for pension money to be incompetently or dishonestly invested. Well, we've prosecuted cases involving embezzlement of pension funds, misuse of pension funds uh, for the personal benefit of the uh, labor union uh, officials who are charged with administering these funds. Uh, we've also prosecuted cases involving the receipt of kickbacks uh, by pension fund employees and trustees uh, for the granting of loans and for the use of this pension fund money. It could be something as simple as using the money to buy a new vacation home for one of them, or it could be the more complex, more subtle situations where the money in the trust fund is, for example, loaned to the employer to build him a new factory, uh, or loaned to the union to finance a new recruiting campaign. We have no real idea of how much fraud there may be in the pension plan area, but you're talking about an institution, the pension plan area generally, that deals in hundreds of billions of dollars. And when you have that much money involved, the federal government ought to take a more, more active role than it does. We regulate insurance completely. We regulate the, the agents, the contract, the reserves, the policies, the sales techniques, the investments. We regulate insurance companies from birth to death. And yet we have a gigantic pension system, almost the size of the insurance industry, a $150 billion business that's essentially unregulated. Can you imagine what would happen if we would let insurance companies do whatever they wanted to? We can't even protect the public with full regulation of insurance. But essentially, we have a pension system which is precisely an insurance plan and which is almost unregulated. This is where most of the pension money now goes, to Wall Street, to be invested. 
It's estimated that private pension fund assets now amount to something like $153 billion. The way they're growing, they very likely will amount to $250 billion by the end of this decade. Pension funds are now the largest institutional investors in the country. They've passed the mutual funds, and there is no end in sight. Typically, the management of pension fund money is handed over to banks, mostly very big banks. Thanks to the piling up of pension fund money, a few banks may administer significant and even controlling amounts of the common stock of very big corporations. An example, more than 10% of such companies as IBM, Ford, IT&T, JCPenney, Westinghouse, and Boise Cascade is held by three banks. 15% of Transworld Airlines is held by two banks, Morgan Guarantee Trust and Chase Manhattan. We remain confident beyond 1973 on a relative. There is so much pension fund money to invest that just finding productive uses for it can be a problem. This is something few outsiders see, an investment meeting at Bankers Trust Company in New York. One of our major concerns is to protect our accounts against risk, risk being defined as underperforming the market in a down market, which uh, it is true we do not forecast. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you think the chemical stocks would fare in the event we do have a weak market over the next six months? Uh, Jay, I was just talking uh, this point over... Critics of the big banks claim that they stick too much to safe investments in big corporations. The bankers insist that their industry is competitive and that all banks seek the highest return with the least risk. Bankers and critics agree that the trust fund investing industry has grown tremendously. The institutions managing trust funds have become so big that they often prefer to trade large blocks of stocks among themselves by computer rather than using the stock exchange. Pension fund money has become so important to the economy that nobody knows what would happen if the system were to be drastically changed, incorporated in Social Security, for example. Ralph Nader opposes that. Nader wants to take pension funds away from the banks and have the government set up a new set of institutions responsible only to the pensioners. Other critics would concentrate on insuring pension benefits and making it possible to take pension rights from one job to another. But almost everybody agrees that some changes are needed. I think time is running out on the private uh, pension system, and if its abuses continue to pile up, and if its enormous uh, uh, popular disappointments uh, begin to be more and more revealed, it might collapse of its own way, uh, and Social Security will have to take up the slack. Over a good number of years, uh, the track record is excellent. It's unfortunate that every now and then some of the tragic cases make the newspapers and the headlines. But it's a question of perspective and balance. When you consider that there are 30 million people covered by the plans, that there are 5 million people uh, receiving about $7 billion in benefits, I think that's a pretty good record. But that's not to say that there aren't a few remaining loopholes that need closing, uh, but uh, we ought to make sure that we don't throw out the baby with the wash water. The solution in the wealthiest country in the world is not to do what they've been doing in terms of pensions. You fund a pension, you fund it on the basis of a man's ability to live, you tie it into cost of living, the wealthiest country in the world ought to be able to do it. You must remember that the corporation has set this plan up voluntarily. They have not been required by law to set it up. Is it a gift from the employer to the employees? That's what it amounts to. I say it's the employee's money, and I think that is the economic fact of life. And I think in terms of the morals of the problem and in terms of the economics of the problem, that anyone would conclude that it does belong to the employee, and yet it's not being used for his benefit. These pension plans are a part of the fringe benefit package like hospitalization insurance and so forth. But it's still a voluntary thing on the part of the corporation. So all I can say is, my God, how can you hold to that view? Do you mean people are supposed to starve, that people are supposed to live on a subsistence money because they are not unique? And that, by the way, is the same attitude that gives top management stock options, gives them retirement after a small serving period, Whereas the middle worker, the lower economic worker, takes a terrible beating.
we're proposing to do a little bit what was done with, with a bank failure problem. We didn't go in and, and take over the banks, but we did, by means of insurance and, and Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, come in and guarantee that no depositor uh, would lose his, his savings at beyond a certain point. And I think that's what we're saying here, that once a worker has put in eight years of uh, time, uh, once he's uh, reached a certain age, uh, once his company's reached a certain point, then he doesn't lose it regardless of what happens to his company or the country. What are they waiting for? What the hell are they waiting for? Do they have to give us a certain, uh, a certain quota, a certain number of people that have to be victims? Do they have to give us a certain amount of money? Uh, how many billions must it, must it take before they do something about this? How many people have to starve? How many people have to lay on the sidelines and just hope and pray? How, many, how much misery do they want before they actually act upon it? This has been a depressing program to work on, but we don't want to give the impression that there are no good private pension plans. There are many good ones, and there are many people for whom the promise has become reality. That should be said. There are certain technical questions that we've dealt with only glancingly. Portability, which means being able to take your pension rights with you when you go from one job to another. Vesting, the point at which your rights in a pension plan become established and irrevocable. Then there's funding, the way the plan is financed so that it can meet its obligations. And insurance, making sure that if plans go under, their obligations can still be met. Finally, there is what is called the fiduciary relationship meaning who can be a pension plan trustee and requiring that those who run pension funds adhere to a code of conduct so that they cannot enrich themselves or make improper loans or engage in funny business with the company management or the union leadership. These are matters for Congress to consider and indeed the Senate Labor Committee is considering them now. There are also matters for those who are in pension plans. If you're in one, you might find it useful to take a close look at it. Our own conclusion about all of this is that it is almost inconceivable that this enormous thing has been allowed to grow up with so little understanding of it and with so little protection and such uneven results for those involved. The situation, as we've seen it, is deplorable. Edwin Newman, NBC News.